All right, so this is gonna be a little bit different than you've seen on our other videos. You know how sometimes you forget to save things or maybe back, uh, you remember when autosave was not a thing? Well, none of that applies because um, actually I just straight up deleted my own videos off of my phone. So whenever you see me talking to you, you're actually gonna see a picture of me. So just imagine that my mouth is moving. Some of the pictures are a little bit funny, try to keep it a little bit lively, and most of them involve my kids or my wife to some extent. So you get to see a little bit more of us. Either way, I hope that you enjoy the content. Back to your regularly scheduled program. My blood type is A positive. I remember because I thought it was a test when I first found out. And I thought, <laughs> hey, nailed this thing. <laughs> Here, go talk to this guy. What's he going to talk to me about? We don't know. Yeah, it's now you got to learn to juggle. And you don't get to stop riding this unicycle. So, good luck. <laughs> I have a very serious question here. What if you can't ride a unicycle? And I'm around my sisters, and I'm like, gosh, I'm tired. Like, all three of them will look at me, and it'll just be like, Whoa. they're like, you're not tired. You don't know what tired is. And I'm like, but I thought I did. Like, I'm, but I this think is my I'm tired. tired. What am I? What, am I? what am I then? And now we are seeing that trend where a lot more men are feeling comfortable looking for help, asking for some support. How do I do this stuff? I've got all this anger or stress or frustration, and I don't know what to do with it. I can't see the back of my head. That's not because I'm an idiot. That's not because I'm stupid or incapable. It's not because <laughs> I need to just, well, just flex your neck better and get more stretchy and then you can do get it. Get yoked, oh, Aaron, like, dang. Why your eye is not in the back of your head, Aaron, gosh. <laughs> Today, we're joined by marriage and family counselor, Aaron Malier. We're going to be asking him what kind of common issues he sees in his counseling experience as well as discussing his thoughts on people going to counseling in general. Just as a disclaimer, we won't be discussing uh, any individual clients in detail out of respect for both their privacy and the law, except if it's me, because then it's my choice. The point instead is to get a professional's input on common obstacles, issues, and problems that people face, and maybe even a few tips on how to handle them. Right now, the real estate market is hot, which is kind of surprising, but also not. If you're stuck inside all the time, you start to realize just how much space you don't have and you might want. The trouble is, when you get to that spot, who do you talk to? Who do you call? What if you could know one of the top 50 realtors in Austin, Texas, and more importantly, one of my favorite human beings of all time? Well, guess what? You can. His name is Barrett Raven. And he is one of the top 50 realtors in Austin. He works at Realty Austin. He has been my realtor and one of my best friends for the last four years. If you're looking for somebody who not only can meet you where you are, but also answer a million questions because he has actually been a middle school teacher, so he's used to it, you should reach out to Barrett and his team at BarrettRaven at RealtyAustin.com. That's B-A-R-R-E-T-T-R-A-V-E-N at realtyaustin.com. Have you ever been like, man, I need to read that book. And then you throw out the excuse that you don't have any time. Well, lucky you, we're now all in quarantine and have way too much time on our hands. And we realize that was never a valid excuse to begin with. But sitting and reading a book may actually take up more of your time. And considering you're listening to this podcast, you might be the type of person that prefers audiobooks. I know I do. I like to be able to multitask, you know, like taking a shower and listening to Extreme Ownership or cooking and listening to The Flip Side, both of which are books that we've mentioned on this podcast. So if you're interested in trying that out, no strings attached, you want to get a free 30-day trial to just see what it's like, I guess, listen and hear what it's like, go to audibletrial.com forward slash MBP. That will get you access to a free 30-day trial, our gift to you. So if you like listening to this podcast, you'll probably like listening to books. Just remember to go to audibletrial.com forward slash MBP. Aaron, we really appreciate you being on our show today. Um, we uh, have waited through the technical difficulties to get to this moment, and uh, we appreciate your your patience. But uh, how's how's the day going for you so far being just that, you know, being stuck inside? that sort of thing. Have you had to do uh, counseling for yourself or 
Is it uh, just, you know, how to do everything and you're a savant when it comes to mental health? Oh yeah. I'm perfect. I've got this all down, Pat. Exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. No, it's, it's really an effort to constantly, you've got to work on yourself always. And, and only in mental health is what you mean by that, right? Only mental health. Every other way, you can just leave it alone. You know, I wish. It it does feel like it's something you have to attend to a little bit of something for yourself every day. Whether that's chocolate, mental health, whether it's chocolate, oh. whether it's <laughs> to try and lift some weights and find some gains or something. I don't know. It's You got to do a little bit of something all the time. Finding some quiet time. Yeah, that doesn't exist in my house. That doesn't. I was about to say. You got two <laughs> kids. You don't. You don't know what quiet is. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Even last night, as I'm like about to go crawl into bed, uh, Charlotte starts crying out. We think she's like having night terrors or something because I went in there and she was still like half asleep. And I was like, "What the heck?" She was just screaming bloody murder a second ago. Anyway, uh, Aaron, we'd love to to start off with you just giving us some background, um, preferably just kind of your story. Uh, then how did you get into what you do? Uh, most importantly, your social security number, blood type, height and weight. Uh, you know, how can we identify you from a crowd? That sort of thing. Where you live. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I'm Aaron. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Texas. I live in Austin. It's a pretty fun town. I enjoy it. I've only lived here a few years, so I'm not like local type person. So don't hold that against me if that's a deal for I'll you. I'll try not to. Uh, my blood type is A positive. I remember because I thought it was a test when I first found out. And I thought, <laughs> I nailed this thing. Crushed it. Uh, Crushed it. You know what? I don't even know what my blood type is. Is that bad? I, that's I probably guess it bad. could be bad. That's probably Depends bad. Depends on what situation you find yourself in. Like if I walked outside this afternoon and got hit by a bus and I needed blood... And they were like, sir, what's your blood type? I'd be like, eh. Yeah, I feel Red. like you got hit by a... <laughs> I feel like if you got hit by a bus, uh, you aren't talking to them. Why is there a bus They'll in my neighborhood? Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. Please continue. So I'm not originally from Texas. I've moved around uh, quite a bit. I grew up mainly in Atlanta and kind of always had this idea that I would do a job that was helping people. Um, it originally started out in kind of a ministry Christian church context. I had a youth pastor that was kind of in charge of all the teen stuff. He was a great guy, helped me learn how to connect to kind of other people, friendships, how to have good male bonding, you know, in like a really healthy way, not any kind of toxic masculinity, not in anything weird or creepy, but like a, hey, here's how you have friends. Here's how you connect to people. I'm an only child. And so I didn't have a lot of good experience in the home because I have no siblings, right? So I didn't learn that very naturally. And after that, I decided I wanted to do a job that was helping people too. I thought, oh, I'll just do the same thing he did. I'll go do youth ministry, work with teens, teach them how to be good people. And tried that for a couple of years and, you know, not really great. Like my blood types an A positive. I'd give myself maybe a B minus, C plus for <laughs> this kind of ministry stuff. It's just a whole lot of things behind the scenes that I was not very good at. Hmm. Like budgets and organizing. And I was also a lot younger, so I didn't really have a clue. It's like all the parts that like all the gears that keep everything running, you just weren't good at. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say that I was decent enough to not have it explode in my face, but definitely not good enough to be really successful or a major champion at that kind of stuff. Right. Are you like me? I'm kind of wired where I'm a leader naturally by just personality type, but I need some sort of like somebody being like, hey, do this. Hey, do this. Like, was that the case or was it just... I was leaning a little more into the relational side, I can better with people um, than I am with organization or structure or being able to plan ahead. Got it. So, hey, we have this big event coming up in three months. Great. I'll that, In three months, we'll deal with that, won't we? Right. Um, rather than planning ahead as good <laughs> as I could have. Gotcha. Wait, so that's not what you're supposed to do? Man, missed that one. So, Aaron, how many years have you been a counselor now or uh what was your official title again 
I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Got it. So how many years have you been a therapist? The official state licensing title. I have been licensed by the state of Texas for marriage and family therapy for just about two years here. Uh, You have to also do this kind of work while you're in grad school for this. And I did it for two or three other years in a pastoral sense when I was working in churches with teenagers and so probably all sudden told closer to five or six years doing this kind of work but a bit over two with the state license piece what's the what's the schooling and or licensing process for somebody in a position like yours the minimum bar is you've got to have a master's degree in a mental health field there's a number that are acceptable like psychology or social work marriage and family therapy mine is specifically and marriage and family therapy, which is a different kind of approach because it looks less at the individual and more how they work in connection with other people, kind of the systems theory. You know, you've got husband and wife and their interaction and kids, or you have, you know, friends or siblings that are needing to go through some counseling together. And it's this larger picture of how everybody contributes to the whole system. Mm -hmm, And from there, we kind of tweak, well, if you put in a little bit different and you do a little bit different and she does a little different, then the whole system works a little different to try and get better results. That's the main approach. So once you get your graduate degree out of the way, there's a national exam you've got to take. It's one of those big four hour exams and hundreds of questions and it's really oh, set yeah. this bar to make sure you're at least minimally competent and not dangerous. And then there's just lots of money you pay to the state for <laughs> verification and certifications and uh, all those appropriate legal things. Uncle but, Sam's got to make sure you're legit. Well, yeah, you don't want <laughs> somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to talk to you about all sorts of important weird stuff (laughs) here go talk to this guy what's he gonna talk to me about we don't know (laughs) i mean you're talking to uh ben as a realtor and me having taken the education test like for the masters of education and being certified through that also having been a um a financial planner we definitely know what it's like to have to take all those tests and then you have to pay all the fees and you have to keep like the continuing education course whatever uh to to keep up to date it's jumping through all the hoops to maintain all the hoops every single hoop that is possible yeah um there are a lot of them yeah i would love to know uh along with the uh, experience that you had with your youth pastor your youth minister what are some events or experiences in your life that have helped to shape just your character as a person as aaron my wife and i got married when i was fairly young i was barely 20 And we had this great adventure idea. We're going to go live abroad and we're going to try and do this youth ministry thing where we love on teenagers and teach them how to be good people and how to kind of do adulting real well. And we went to go live in New Zealand for a little while, raise some money, working with some people there. It was great. But shortly after our first year anniversary, we found out we were pregnant with our first son, who hadn't been intending to have children this early because I mean, keep in mind at this point, I'm 21. And so this grand adventure plan we had of living on the other side of the world and doing all this stuff radically changed when we realized we're going to have a family. I'm an only child, like I mentioned. And so I'm not going to try and raise my kid halfway around the world. My parents would um, politely, they would not approve. It would be very sad. (laughs) You'd be cold in your stocking, 100%. Oh, yeah, all the time. (laughs) He's not invited back Christmas. (laughs) Yeah, that that kind of experience of now I'm a dad, now we're having a family, and I have to finish graduating college real fast and find a job and make some money to take care of the new family that I'm going to have that's now growing was a pretty big shock and a big change. It required a lot out of me as a human being to go from pull, you know, like I was like this, I was 20, 21, stereotypical, like college guy, not really thinking about the future, planning, just kind of in the moment, living life, doing things to now I've got to be responsible and be a grown up. And that was probably the biggest one that really changed how I had to orient myself about my life and my future. 
Yeah, I can't imagine how kids would change everything <laughs> in your world. Micah, isn't that what you did? It changed it's something everything, like that. right? <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. It's like the simplest thing, you know, I, I was trying to explain to somebody, like even just trying to coordinate or schedule time to get something done with someone else is like a, a big deal. It, it actually takes tremendous amounts of effort and coordinating and going back and forth until finally, you know, you land on a time that, yeah, I can actually come over at this time. Um, cause it's, it's tough when, especially right now you got kids at home, parents at home, but then parents are both trying to do things, but then you have to alternate like who's doing what, when, because somebody has got to be watching the kids. So it's, even just the simplest things uh, become so difficult. They can't just watch themselves. That's a thing, right? Charlotte could. It's just a matter of what would she be doing if she was <laughs> watching herself? What would she be getting into? I feel like that's something that as somebody without kids hears all the time is, you know, we're for us specifically, like we're not really in a place right now in life that's, ideal for having children and like i like so that's where we're at in life right now but when i mention that to people with kids the overwhelming <laughs> story i get is ben you're never gonna be really ready like yeah they just they come i'm and still not ready you and just I deal too. with it <laughs> yeah listen this is my job my main specialty is started working with teens and their families and i've got a teenager myself and another kid and i'm still not ready i have a grad degree in this and i'm still not ready i'm licensed by the state and i'm still not ready you've Everybody. checked all the boxes and you still failed you're like i'm i can't do this I'm, I'm not ready for it your professors were like go ahead go enjoy life you're ready and you're like no no i'm not keep me safe keep me safe how did that uh, with your life experiences and having uh, a kid I, I believe it's your son right that you're talking about? Yeah, I have two sons, but me and my oldest one I had when I was, I turned 22 and he was born four days later. Nice. So how did that shape your character? Back to the original question, like, I, I know that's a, a life altering event, but how did that affect you now looking back in retrospect? Well, as soon as we found out we were pregnant, or not really we, because I didn't do any of the pregnancy part other than getting it started. <laughs> You just lit the I, fuse. Yep. <laughs> right. Um, I I had to graduate college. I had to reshuffle all the classes I had and figure something out to graduate within that next semester so I could start working. I had a fire lit under me to make sure that I was able to provide and take care of this family that I had now. It made me realize that life was much more than just having fun, playing video games, and sleeping in too much. But now like, oh, I've got people that will depend on me that if I don't do it, it won't happen. You know, and it's like now I've got to point myself in a direction. Now I'll still find time for fun and relaxing. Yeah, but I, I've got to actually be going somewhere and doing something. All, all while still juggling the responsibilities. Like you have to plan for the future while dealing with the present. Yeah, it's now you got to learn to juggle and you don't get to stop riding this unicycle. So good luck. <laughs> I have a very serious question here what if you can't ride a unicycle <laughs> well my friend that's what the safety net is for because you're already on the tightrope and good luck <laughs> <laughs> i like how you phrase that too so not only is it difficult to juggle all this but you're also riding a unicycle <laughs> yeah it sure feels like that sometimes it really gets okay like it's one of those things just like just about anything in life you get enough practice and enough skill with it that eventually you can feel like you kind of manage yeah but just as if you're riding a unicycle and juggling you really can't take your eye off the balls you, you have to still pay attention even when it feels natural even when you're out of balance sometimes on that unicycle like how do you div you know uh divide your attention amongst everything because that's that's one of the things like uh and i'd love to kind of get into questions about like topics you encounter but it sounds like we've already found one uh and that's <laughs> parenting and just juggling in general you know for you having gone through 
that life shift of having one kid and then uh, eventually having a second child looking back on the the video games and sleeping in version of you when that's all that was um in terms of like you know as you put it like just the responsibility load was very different has that given you a new perspective on how to relate to now your clients or patients or however you refer to them typically i talk about clients when i'm working in my private practice or with the okay. nonprofit that i work with uh, they were patients when i was working at the hospital so Okay. That's how we try and we try and think about them as clients. Like you're asking for something and I'm trying to help. It gives you a little more power, makes you feel a little better than like, oh, I'm broken. Come fix me. But right. no, 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 sure. we're in this together. You're you're coming to get some services and I'm just gonna help you. Try and make it less scary for people because it's it's pretty scary um to admit that you don't know what you're doing. We all have this conception somehow that everybody else knows what they're doing and everybody else has their life together or has things figured out, at least on the whole, we could always point to that one person we know that does not have a clue. <laughs> that guy, he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, correct. But so most of us kind of have this idea, other people know what they're doing. And so it's hard to figure out what I need help because I don't even know where to begin. And that really helped get me started on what am I going to do to help people with their kids? Because that's some of the things that I see. One of the most common experiences that I've got as a therapist is people dealing with that family relationship. How do I get my kids to either stop being the sleeping in all day, playing video games and not being able to apply themselves or do anything, to, you know, towards their future, what they want versus how do I control my anger and frustration when my kids aren't listening to me or when my wife and I are fighting or the husband and I are at it odds and the kids won't listen. And those are the kinds of questions I get a lot. It's, it sounds like typical things that people go through are what you help with. But the problem is for one reason or another, people don't identify them as typical problems. Like they, they think um, I, I'm going to project a little bit here. I'm, I'm going to project onto what you're talking about and, you can tell me how accurate it is or not. Uh, something that we saw and it then led to us starting this podcast, even of it in and of itself, is the fact that what we see on social media or what other people are displaying tends to be the highlight reel. And it's not actually really what's going on. So then that leads to this feeling of, uh, for you know, for me, like I'll look at Ben's life. This is hyperbole. We have very different lives, but let's say I, I look at Ben's life and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's got it all together. He has an awesome house. Like he just redid the floors. Like that must have been super easy. And he has a pool, and he's got dogs, and he has a a lovely wife. Like he's got it going for him. I everything's falling apart around me. So something must be wrong with me. And what you're saying, it sounds like actually most people are dealing with the same issues, but none of them are talking to each other about it unless they're coming to you. Is that even remotely what you were saying or is it different than that? What do you, what do you think? That's fantastic. That's a really good way to capture all this. People are dealing with so many similar problems. It's almost as if everybody has the same handful of problems we're dealing with and too afraid to talk about it or own up to it because we think we'll be weak or that's going to expose us for the frauds we feel like we are. It's going to create more problems. People are now going to judge me if they think that I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not really in control. And the kind of social media experience most people get is like you talked about that highlight reel of let me show you the very best of what I've got because that's the only thing I want anyone else to see. Yeah. And it's, and we, we admit like, at least here on the show, it's pretty natural. Like think about if somebody says, Hey Aaron, how's your day going? The the knee jerk response is good. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not like you're like, well, um, so my day, uh, so it started out with, and then this happened and then actually this was supposed to happen and it didn't, you don't do that. You just say it's good and you, you move on, but it's um, not good. It's yeah, no part of it is good. I, I feel like, at least for me, and Ben, I'd love to know what your thought is on this. Um, I feel like for me, I 
I look at my life and I, I always have a choice of which aspects I'm going to focus on. And there is always good. And there's always bad. Uh, even just for anybody listening right now, like the bad is quarantine life, right? Um, we, we all have that in common. So if that's the bad, I could focus on that and focus on how I haven't been to the gym in two months, my sanctuary away from home, um, how we can't go to Pine House Pizza, even though that's my other sanctuary away from home. But instead, I'm trying to focus on the good. The good is this podcast has been getting up and going. Um, Elizabeth and I are communicating more and better than we have before. Uh, so it's it seems like if I was then to think about other people's lives, everybody has the good and bad going on in their life at the same time. It's just a matter of what they're focusing on. Ben, is that similar to you or is that just Micah Brown? No, it's funny. Cause like, as you're talking about, uh, you're like, Oh, I'm going to project. And this is, you know, Ben's got a great life and you start naming things. He's got a great house. He has a great, you know, he's got a pool. He just redid his floors. It's funny. Cause it's like in that moment, everything you're naming, most of those things stress me out. <laughs> So it's not like Perfect. it's a, yeah, it's not like it's, oh, he has all these things. It's, you know, he has it all together. And it's in reality, he has all these things and they all cause boatloads amount of stress and like it's borderline cri crippling. Um, so I think it's, we have this idea that just, you know, reiterating what everybody else is saying is we have this idea that everything that we're going through is unique. You know, our situation is unique, our problem is unique. And kind of like Aaron said is there's, you know, there, we're all people experiencing pretty much the same things, you know, situations vary, but we're all walking the same walk. We're all going through the same thing. So I think it's kind of silly to think that, oh, well, my situation is unique. What if people will judge me for this? I have found that after starting this podcast and just, making the decision, Micah, that we're going to be open and honest with people has really affected everything else in my life. My marriage has improved. It's not fantastic, but it's improved. My communication with my friends has improved. Kind of the way I think through things has has just improved. And it's just because I it this podcast has really allowed me to let people into areas of my life that I prior felt maybe ashamed of or didn't want to talk about because oh my situation's unique right i don't know if that answers your question yeah i feel like people don't have a monopoly on pain or struggle yeah you know aaron as succinctly as you could put it what would you think are the five most common topics or situations that you encounter just to to give you some assistance and getting started as if you needed it. You've already mentioned like juggling life with kids sounds like one topic. What would be, I guess, four others? So we've got, like we talked about the parenting in general, um, not just the, how do I juggle my own life and then manage my kids, but how do I do parenting well? Because it's a challenge. Enough people could probably manage parenting that I can take care of a child's basic needs and get them food and clothing and kind of keep them on a decent track but it's how to do that really well and develop those relationships that's a huge one that i deal with a lot um then okay. there's you know interpersonal relationships whether that's a, a partner a spouse sibling you know like roommate like those relationships are really difficult because then it's not just me how do i teach or train this little human being to do it but how do i interact with this person who's supposed to be a full-grown adult and us supposed to be <laughs> yeah yep and, uh, kind of how do we get along together yeah you've, you've helped us with that one just with some family familial stuff and it's been it's been peaceful in our end so i appreciate your help sorry continue um so we've got kids and marriage for family that kind of thing we also Something else I see quite a lot, uh, stress and anxiety. Like, how do you deal with your environment? I've got, whether it's work stress or whether it's some kind of bad experience I had, I've got a problem with a certain part of my life that's external from me that I have a hard time interacting with. You know, like, maybe it's work is just miserable and I can't figure out why I'm so unhappy. 
mm-hmm. or something like that. I deal also a lot with people that are just feeling kind of like anxiety, like internally, they just feel ramped up or stressed or angry or, or some kind of really negative emotional state that they don't, they don't believe they have a handle on. They see it kind of exploding or leaking out everywhere and they want some help. How do I deal with this thing inside of me that I can't seem to manage? Man. Those are like the, the four big things that I deal with the most. I guess if I had to throw a fifth one in there, the kind of other thing we kind of look to or maybe some not so much fun to talk about, but like really big traumatic things that happen in your life, like big T trauma. You know, little T trauma is the kind of stuff that goes day in and day out and it is stuff that's hard like if you're in a chronically unsafe environment you know like there's always food scarcity or you're worried about this or oh no i'm getting yelled at by people i'm being picked on constantly at school that's kind of a typically this will be called low like lower t trauma Uh, big t traumas are like a giant car wreck or somebody gets shot or i get you know mugged in the alleyway one time something like that's a usually called a big T trauma. No kidding. Speaking from experience, we had the thing that started my depression, uh, looking back on it was a big T trauma, big car wreck while dealing with a lot of stress in our our personal life, like house shopping, found out we were pregnant seven weeks along and then gotten a serious car wreck, herniated another disc, Elizabeth dislocated her shoulder. Like, yeah, that was, that was some big T trauma happening right then. Oh yeah, that'll do it, man. To, I, I've got a I've got a, a question um, just elaborating more on the top five topics if you and I don't know if this is something that you can share uh, as far as like demographics go like what would you say your average age range is for somebody that is coming in to talk to you I mean that's a challenging one to like give a really super meaningful answer Mm -hmm. for me personally and maybe it's just because of who i am the people that seek me out tend to i find i tend to have a lot of people that are dealing with like the parenting kind of stuff or the kind of relationship stuff tend to be somewhere in their maybe really late 20s to mid 40s because that's kind of yeah, when you got young kids and when you're still trying to figure out life. I feel like past 40, like you've got an idea of like how to do it, right? But like late 20s to mid 30s, or I guess like the first kid or two, uh, as you're trying to figure out this thing called parenting can be stressful. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And I think part of the reason I get that kind of age bracket is just because of who I am. But also, like you mentioned, that's when most of these things happen for people. Right. Most people tend to statistically, you know, they'll get married late 20s, mid 30s, and they're mm-hmm. having kids either, you know, somewhere between 30 to late 38, 39, somewhere in that range a lot. And so that's when you're experiencing the things that are most difficult and different from you in, a, in your history. And that's when they reach out. Gotcha. And yeah, once you hit like 40, you're just like, eh, I'm done trying to control anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still deal with some people that are a, a good bit older and, and past that age. Yeah. Um, I have some people that are older than like my grandparents that I've worked with in several contexts. So there's never too late to ask for help and never too early. Absolutely but not. Yeah. yeah, generally I, that range is where most of the turmoil and change happens that people are really thrown for a loop. Yeah, that makes sense. I wish I had come to you sooner, personally, but <laughs> hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, of course. I feel like we already kind of answered the which topic do you interact with the most. That would be parenting. This kind of gets into more of the, I guess, the macro trends and not just individuals that come to meet with you, but maybe like things that you see happening around us that affect us. Uh, like, I don't know, the apocalypse right now. Um, so mm-hmm. are there any common social trends that facilitate, you know, parenting or stress uh, or any of really of these five happening more? Like what what other external influences could be affecting the the negative internal struggles that, that people are dealing with when they come to you? you know, outside of pandemic and stay at home where we're now in close <laughs> proximity with people all the time, it's usually transitional moments are the most difficult for people mm. as would make sense, right? You know, you're doing yep. one thing and you feel like you got it. You got to go do a new thing and that's hard. 
So I speak to a lot of people, a lot of the college students that have wanted to talk with me usually reach out at the beginning of school or towards the end of the year when they're having to go back home because now, wait a minute, how do I kind of reintegrate with my parents and their family when I'm at home because I was on my own doing my own thing at college and mm -hmm. you know those kinds of spaces in life where you transition. I do a lot of like pre-marriage work too for people that are about to get married to try and get them ready. Try. <laughs> yeah, because like, you know, like you've got kids, you know how no one can really explain to you what it's like to have kids or what it's like to be a parent. It just happens and then you have kids and now life is different. I feel Marriage like it's is like that, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's like the difference between you read about it in a magazine article versus like it's your daily life. You know, words don't mean the the full weight of what they're supposed to until you have the experience to tie with it. Um, it's kind of like, you you know, my brother and, you know, Luke, my nephew, um, he has really severe allergies. Uh, he has been in the hospital a few different times. And I never like logically and even emotionally to an extent, I I hated that for him. Um, I knew that that was a terrible experience. I knew that was really tough on my brother and Ashley. Um, I know that all around that was really difficult for them seeing their their son go through that. But it wasn't until Lily was in the hospital for a week and a half, you know, going through the PICU, the NICU, um, all those things, that I had that emotional weight behind those thoughts and feelings that were there before. So I feel like it's kind of the same thing. Like Ben doesn't have kids and that's, I'm not harping on, but he doesn't, he can't feel the weight of how tough parenting can be. He can, he, to the full extent of like, if he had his own kids. Um, but I feel like Ben is pretty sympathetic when it comes to me being like, dude, I might duct tape Charlotte inside of her closet. Um, I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm joking for anybody. Silence that thinks is I'm golden, serious. but duct tape yeah. is silver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got three older sisters and I've got uh, 10, 11, each, each sister has at least two kids. So let's just put it that way. And some have three and it's just, it, there's something to be said for that. I think that, and, and it's, when there is grace given for people who, cause it's tough to relate. I feel with, with, people who have children when like discussing normal everyday things because you're like my normal everyday differs so much than like say your everyday Micah like it is mm -hmm. completely night and day and so I like it's like something about you that I that is very that I really like is when you talk about kids and I'm like oh I, I can't relate I feel like a lot of times people hold that against you like, oh, you don't have kids. You don't know. And it's just like, I'm at a different stage in life. Don't hate. <laughs> like when I'm around my sisters and I'm like, gosh, I'm tired. Like all three of them will look at me and it'll just be like, Whoa. they're like, you're not tired. You don't know what tired <laughs> is. And I'm like, but I thought I did. Like, I'm, but I this is my I'm tired. tired. What, what, what am I? What, do I? what am I then? Tell me what I am. Like yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, that's something that you do very well, Mike, is you're, you're very good about making people feel, uh, under like, listen, I get that you don't have kids, but like, this is where I'm at. Yeah. So. I don't ever want to make you or anybody feel wrong in your feelings. Um, you know, you're, you're at a different life stage. So to you, your extreme of tiredness means one thing. And my extreme of tiredness means another thing. And we can both simultaneously be totally exhausted from two totally different experiences. Uh, <laughs> right. And either way, we're still at the same spot. <clears throat> I'm sure Aaron's sitting over there going, good, good, Micah. <laughs> Let him have his feelings. You know. <laughs> <laughs> if that comes from you, Aaron, then I appreciate it. It has something like... I'm sure I there's some in there. I'm sure there's some Aaron <laughs> inside of me, like the little voice being like, like a don't be a jerk the voice of reason jerk. don't be a jerk <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i kind of want to i want to get into a little bit i don't feel like we I, I feel like we answered part of this question micah uh and aaron i feel like we answered part of this question but i think micah you were looking for 
maybe something different. So I'm going to kind of prod this a little bit more. So when uh, Aaron, when Micah was talking about social trends that facilitate that topic happening more often. Um, so obviously I think the, the, it makes sense that life change. So like big life changes, but I'm interested as society as a whole, is there a trend of anything really happening that's contributing to people coming in more you seeing more of the same topic like is there something that fundamentally as people like just an observation that you personally see that is affecting people more than other things necessarily would does that make sense yeah what i see is that a lot of celebrities have this space where they're being transparent and their increased visibility allows a lot of people to feel more comfortable. Like, hey, if that person goes to therapy and they're okay to talk about it, maybe it's okay for me to talk about it too. Interesting. Because they're obviously, they're a celebrity and their life is great and perfect and shiny is the kind of way that gets, you know, caricatured. Yeah, well, and, it almost, it makes people can relate with that. So, oh, if this big person can do that and they're in front of the camera all the time, then... It must be okay. I can go do that. Yeah, it's got a way of normalizing that experience that no, even the people that we would consider maybe quote unquote, like the most put together and professional and their life is as good as it could possibly be. They're willing to open up about struggles and problems. So maybe it's okay if I, as a lesser, quote unquote, lesser person, I'm not as famous or put together, whatever, I can have those problems too. And that normalization has really helped. Um, there's still definitely a stigma because people, it's that kind of old school toxic masculinity of like, you know, men don't cry, would suck it up. And mm -hmm. oh, it's that's not helpful. Patient versus it, client. The, that wording is everything. Yeah, because I really want people to see that this is not a space where you come to me and I dole out some nugget of wisdom or I wave my magic wand and just fix your life and your problems. Right. I'm trying to help people recognize that what we do is I help you dig and figure out what's going on and help bring that conflict up to the front, up to the surface. And we kind of look at it together and say, what do you want to do about it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but you definitely had a magic wand when I met with you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I walk in, he's like, all right, you're fixed. You're gone your way. See you later. Yeah, I think that the the point about the celebrities, okay, they should have it all together and they don't. So I guess I'm okay to talk about this too. I think that it also goes hand in hand with just perception of a topic in general. I feel like if more people were, and I don't know how this would realistically play out, but I feel like if more people were even open about it on social media, just regular people, being willing to talk about things and being like, you know, saw my counselor today. Here was a really cool tip. They said for dealing with depression, you don't have to like tell what you're dealing with in total or how depression affects you or anything like that. But even just the casual, like Aaron told me to wipe cold water on my face. It helps to calm me down when I'm feeling anxious and stressed out, which is usually my tipping point for depression. I feel like that would really help people. And the more frequently that we see that kind of thing, then it becomes normalized to have those conversations. And then it becomes a little bit easier. But right now it just seems like people with high visibility, when they say something, there's a bigger splash. So they have the the platform to say something like that from, and it it's going to have a broader impact. Aaron, is there more of a, a trend between men and women, like who comes more to counseling? And has there been a, a shift in even just the time that you've been doing this job? Yeah, I mean, it used to be a much more... Um you know, female dominated field and female dominated like clients. It was kind of, you know, you think 30 years ago, when it started becoming a lot more mainstream that they were like, yeah, women are the ones that have the emotions and their emotions are all crazy. So they need to go to somebody and get those fixed. And, and that was like a really unhealthy way that it started. But the more we start to recognize that, you know, we as men have emotions too, and we're often just not taught how to use them or manage them or interact with them in any helpful way. And now we are seeing that trend where a lot more men are feeling comfortable looking for help, asking for some support. How do I do this stuff? I've got all this anger or stress or frustration and I don't know what to do with it. And the old school, you know, just tough it up, be a man kind of 
toxic mantra that we used to get told. <laughs> yeah, we're starting to see how that's failing and it didn't work and it's not working. And now we're left with kind of these broken pieces and we look going, well, well the toxic masculinity didn't work. What am I going to do now? Well, let me maybe go ask somebody. How would you define toxic masculinity? I mean, it's a multifaceted and complicated piece, but the thing that stands out to me is the idea that being a man means being strong in every kind of sense of what that means. Like I have to be, but not just strong as in I have this capacity and this strength, but almost I have to be hard and steely and Impermeable. unbending, unbreakable, callous, unshakable. It does tend to be callous and cold and unfeeling. It's the idea of what strength can be taken to this really twisted extreme. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I've seen. You know, we we talked about on the uh, episode where we shared our miscarriage story, how Elizabeth was told by multiple people like, oh, you, you don't need to tell people that you're pregnant until after a certain week, just in case something happens. And mm -hmm. it's like, what? I, I'm sorry. Like, so I can just be alone in all this, like excitement and sadness, like just in case something happens. That doesn't seem right. And that's why, like, with our second miscarriage, before it even happened, we had decided we're going to tell people. And if something happens, at least they'll be with us in it. I don't understand the the impermeable attitude of, like, no, like, nobody needs to hear that. Like, I don't need to talk about it. Well, I feel like something uh, like that, when somebody says something like that, it's like, that's more for them than for you. Like, hey, listen, I know you're going through this, like, really hard thing, but, like, I don't want to know about it. Like that, that's kind of what that says to me is that's why you're not supposed to tell people, you know, before 12 weeks, it's like, I'm sorry. So what you're saying is I shouldn't share this with, 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 with people. Is it so you don't have to go through it? Like I'm going through this. Why is this? I don't know. Like in my head, I, that kind of like, I feel like that, that makes it about that person and it shouldn't be. Aaron, is that something that you see, you know, doing what you're doing? Like people talking to you and saying, I feel like I can't share how I'm feeling with this person or that person. Yeah. There's the idea that we've got this individualism that we have to really be strong in our own way and our own selves by ourselves and it gets twisted to mean like alone and without other people and so i don't want to deal with your stuff you don't want to deal with my stuff and what maybe even started as a nice thing of like oh i've got this negative experience i don't want to burden other people with it it started to become well, you can't burden me with yours either. And I've got to keep it in and I've got to keep it hidden and quiet because we all have to live in these silos by ourselves. Yeah, we all have problems. We're, we're all dealing with it. Yeah, and when we're willing to open up and say like, yeah, this is life and it's messy and it's not always sunshine and rainbows, we can start to share and connect and somebody else will go, well, yeah, I've got that problem too. And then it's so much more comforting and connective with friend groups and across different barriers and lines and we can see we're all people and we all have a lot of similar problems and experiences is there like any specific societal trends or, or things that you see over the course of your career that have had either negative or unintended consequences regarding our mental health tide pod challenge mm, yeah <laughs> i think <laughs> you know in a really, um, in a more serious way, like there's a, been a trend for a, a number of years, not as much now, but um, before that was all about for depression, anxiety, stress, it's just go get some medication, just take a pill and fix your problems. Mm -hmm. When even in the best of circumstances, medication is only ever one piece of a solution. And like, even if you break your leg, right? You don't just go get a cast. You're going to have to do some physical therapy. You're going to have to learn to walk new and different. There's still mm -hmm. things you're going to have to do Preach and think about and feel differently. So with mental health, the idea for a while had been, oh, well, it's something that's wrong with your brain physiologically. So we'll get you the right kind of medication and that will fix everything. Mm -hmm. And that's all you have to do. So that had been a real big problem where people were just looking for the quick fix. And mm -hmm. so when you talk to them in therapy and you say, hey, this is actually a long process and it's 
difficult because it's going to require you to think about who you are and look deeply at yourself, ask questions and make changes and live your life differently than you have been. That's really scary and a lot to take in. People don't like looking in the mirror, metaphorically speaking. Sometimes literally. I don't tend to like looking in the mirror literally either. Yeah, it's hard to face yourself because we spend a lot of time trying to present the best version of ourselves that it's scary to admit or acknowledge that there are less than perfect parts. Yeah. Well, Aaron, I appreciate your time. I want to kind of wrap things up here. We always like to give some encouragement to people that are listening to this podcast and maybe resonating with what we're talking about. Maybe they've been thinking for a while, like I should go talk to somebody uh, that is a professional in the same way. Like I, I don't just ask my neighbor, Hey, can you come look at my car and, and, you know, just take a whiff at whatever is going on and see if you know what to fix. I would rather go talk to a professional mechanic and say, tell me exactly what's wrong and how exactly I can fix it. Um, so there might be somebody out there right now who's thinking, I mean, I've talked to my friends and they've helped me out, but what if I talk to a professional? I would love to know from you both kind of in general, what, what encouragement do you have for people that are listening right now that maybe have been dealing with something? And then also, what do you wish people listening uh, would do more often to just help themselves? Maybe they go hand in hand, maybe they don't, but I wanted to pose them both at the same time in case they do. One, if you're thinking maybe you should talk to somebody, please do. We all need some help. We all need to talk to somebody and get some different perspective. I, I try and tell people this shouldn't be scary. Therapy is not this big, I don't know, you lay down on the couch and I have my little notepad and you tell me all about your childhood and we, you know, like, if you want to do that, we can, sure. But most of the time, it doesn't look like that. It's two people having a conversation and helping look at what's not going great and how we could maybe try something different. I tell people that, you know, therapy is supposed to be a professional with an outside perspective. Like now in quarantine, we're all cutting our own hair, maybe, or that's the thing, right? Been Bad good. quarantine haircuts. Shaving our own so, heads. <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I've been trying to, like when I try and cut my own hair and do things, I can't see the back of my head. That's not because I'm an idiot. That's not because I'm stupid or incapable. It's not because <laughs> I need to just, well, just flex your neck better and get more stretchy and then you can do get it. Getting yoked, oh, Aaron. Like, Dang. Why your eye is not in the back of your head, Aaron? Gosh. <laughs> right? It's like, it doesn't work that way. You have to have somebody else look at the back of your head to make sure you didn't miss a spot and help with that piece. That's maybe how therapy can work for a lot of us. Maybe we can get a lot of our own stuff dealt with on our own, but there's always spots you can't see mm -hmm. just because of your own perspective and your own life. So you get somebody outside of the situation. Friends are great, but sometimes they're too close. Family is nice, but sometimes again, they're too close. You need somebody who's distant and a lot more objective who can say, Oh, you missed a spot back there. Yeah. And it, at least in my experience with you, uh, the third party does that very tactfully. It's not like, Here's 17 reasons why you're a terrible human being, Micah Brown. Um, I already have that list, so I don't need Aaron to, you know, tell me it. But um, I, I do appreciate the times just to be vulnerable with people listening uh, that I've gone to you and, you know, the conversation about who's driving the bus, uh, where you and I mentioned throughout my personal history, I previously had had my logical self driving the bus and I've been trying to kick off my emotions, be like, get the heck off the bus. And that then led to me bottling up internally and unintentionally all of my emotions until they just exploded. And it, most people think of like when your emotions explode, they think of like anger. For me, I bottled up serious sadness. I hadn't allowed myself to really feel happy about stuff because I was trying to just push forward through life. Uh, so those things had bottled up. I burst into tears and started crying I, I had to run out of the gym to run to my car and i burst into tears couldn't figure out why and mm. then i came to you that next week aaron and i was like um this is weird does this happen and why am like, i yeah. crying <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what to do so yeah you you've definitely helped me with that and then also the then the inverse happened i overcorrected and i let my emotions out a little too much and it's not like when we think of emotions we at least I, I think the stereotype is like of somebody breaking down crying and just sobbing uncontrollably. For me, it was more like I would openly say, I'm really angry right now, or 
yeah, I'm really sad. So I'm not going to go do my things that like my responsibilities. I'm not going to take care of them because I want to make sure that I'm feeling what I should be feeling right now. So you have definitely been a great outside third party person. That's just been a guide rail to keep me um, within the right brackets of like a human response to situations. So um, I appreciate that. Glad to be able to be helpful. Aaron, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on our episode. Yeah, thanks Wouldn't so much for coming on. We have a have you back on another time. Maybe do a counseling session for Ben and me if we have issues. Um, but <laughs> just kidding. Aaron, tell uh, me what's wrong with me. <laughs> but we appreciate your time, Aaron, and uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks. I yeah, appreciate thanks so being much. here and have a good day too. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening and supporting us. If you'd like to continue to support us in the MVP podcast, you can actually head over to audible.com. The link should be in the description and sign up for the free 30-day trial. It's our gift to you. It's awesome. It's risk-free. And guess what? You get to get all of that reading done that you've been wanting to do without any reading. All you have to do is listen to it. Also, if you like the podcast, please share with friends and family as this is for them too. And lastly, if you want to connect with us, you can actually reach us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at ActualMVP. Or you can email us at ActualMVP at gmail.com. That is all. Y'all have a good one. Thanks.